program is recorded at RELA's annual logistics conference in Orlando, Florida. I'm pleased to welcome Editor-in-Chief of Supply Chain Brain, Russell Goodman. Analyzing supply chain root cause damage. Joining us to talk about that today is Gene Bodenheimer, Senior Vice President, Damage Research at Genco Supply Chain Solutions. Gene, welcome. Thank you, Russell. Gene, what would you say is the primary objective in performing supply chain root cause damage analysis for a, a manufacturer or a retailer? Uh, Russell, typically it's to identify and eliminate those uh, causes, the root causes and drivers of damage throughout the supply chain from point of manufacture to point of sale. Now, I'm sure the one thing that uh, viewers of this video are going to want to know is what are the benefits that I'm going to derive if I have such an analysis performed? Typically, the benefits come in two forms. First, financial. Uh, as you might imagine, any, uh, any product that's damaged in the supply chain prevents the success that is intended for that product to make it into the shopper's basket for use or consumption at home. So uh, that is a, a negative impact from a financial perspective, both from the cost of the product itself as well as handling those damaged products, removing them from the supply chain. Uh, so anything that you can do to prevent damage to products in the supply chain will have a positive impact to the bottom line profitability. The second benefit comes in the form of customer satisfaction. Uh, damage in, in the supply chain is one of those components of customer dissatisfaction, whether it be from a manufacturer to a retail DC or whether it be from the retail DC to the store store being the internal customer of that retail DC. So if you eliminate the levels of damage, you improve the level of customer satisfaction for you. Is there a standard approach that you take when you're doing this type of analysis? The, uh, the Six Sigma DMAIC approach, which is, uh, lends itself very well to this process. The uh, first step being define the issue or design the study. Uh, Second step being measure, collect the, the data on the, uh, the products in the supply chain, then analyze that data to identify those root causes. The uh, I is for improve. You have to develop the uh, improvement plan, the, the fix, if you will, and then control. Uh, develop and, and implement the uh, plan to sustain the improvement. Now, Gene, you and uh, Genco have been at this type of thing for some time now. What have you found to be the, the usual causes or drivers for the kind of damage that we're talking about here? There, there are a number of uh, common causes that we have seen over, over the years. Uh, one of the most common types of damages would be in the form of compression damage, either to the case of product or to the individual consumer unit uh, package inside the case. And that compression damage can be caused by many different uh, factors, starting with the, uh, the pallet or platform that the, the product is unitized onto to begin with. So if you have, uh, we've seen situations where incomplete or inadequate deck coverage for the pallet will cause edges of the cases to drop down into the gaps between the deck boards, causing compression. Or if you have uh, the pallet itself in a condition that is not favorable for uh, use in the supply chain, that will lead to it. Other areas, uh, overhang of products ac across the edge of the, uh, the pallet will certainly impact the compression level, and uh, excessive underhang can lead to shifting, load shifting that will impact and have a different type of compression, but still there. Um, the other, the other factors uh, within that compression arena can be the type of uh, stretch wrap application, whether it's done too tightly, compressing things, or too loosely that allows products to move and uh, impact each other. Um, some of the other forms, uh, as you may be aware, 75% of the strength of, of a corrugate case is in the four corners of the case. So, misalignment of cases within the stacks in a unit load has a, a dramatic negative impact on uh, the ability to withstand compression. So those are just some of the factors. Uh, you, you have other, other instances where uh, you may have excessive stacking heights and that can come in two forms. You can have uh, 
a corrugate case that is designed with a maximum stacking height on any individual uh, stack. And uh, uh, we've seen numerous cases where the, the height of that exceeds the, uh, the, the strength of the case. In other instances, we've seen plainly labeled on the cases that they're designed for unit loads to be stacked no more than three high, four high in a uh, floor stack situation in a warehouse. And often we'll see where they will exceed that because they have space, they have clear space uh, in, the, in the warehouse, so they'll stack them five high. And that leads to additional compression damage. But that compression is primarily the number one uh, incidence that we see. If I uh, were to say, eh, damage, it's a cost of doing business. What would you tell me? Would you say, no, no, it's preventable? Uh, it most often is preventable. Um, in most instances, what we find is the, uh, the situation can be corrected with a relatively low cost solution. Oftentimes it's with a, a minor uh, packaging change or it can be a straightforward change to handling processes. You may uh, find in some cases that uh, the published guidelines and specs for handling products are not being followed, so getting adherence to the published guidelines can correct the issue. And in some cases, it's just a matter of applying good old common sense. Uh, we, we do see in, uh, where it's not as straightforward and simple as that, uh, there has to be a cost-benefit analysis done to see if the, the cost of the corrective measure, in fact, is going to be justifiable by the return on that uh, that investment in the, in the corrective measure. And there are times when that uh, cost of corrective measure far exceeds the cost of the problem itself. And in that situation, it would become an identified cost of doing business. But in most cases, it is preventable. Are we talking about something that's a one-time project, or is this a component of a larger continuous improvement program? It, uh, it often starts out as a one-time, or it's initiated as a one-time project that would be uh, to address a specific issue, uh, a specific problem that's been identified. And once the results are in and the, the value of the process itself is, is recognized, then it more often than not becomes a, a part of an ongoing continuous improvement body of work for the company because they have recognized the value of doing this. Is um, the level of investment, now I'm sure this is something that uh, many uh, uh, viewers want to know about, uh, what level of ROI can I expect if I implement a program like what you're talking about? It, uh, as you can imagine, it will vary. The ROI will vary depending on the, uh, the nature of the issue that's been identified, the uh, causes and the, the elements, the drivers that have been identified that need to be corrected. So the, uh, the, it will vary, but it is not uncommon, Russell, to see a, an ROI of 10 times to as much as 100 times the uh, cost of the investment in the process and the corrective measure itself. So this translates um, many times into hundreds of thousands of dollars, even into uh, millions of dollars of sustainable savings for that company. And you can easily understand from that that uh, it would become a, a part of an ongoing process once a company realizes that kind of return on investment. Well, Gene, this has been a fascinating conversation. You may just have saved some company a lot of money. We, uh, we, that's what we're in the business to do, is to help identify ways to save money and increase profits. Well, thanks for being with us today. You're welcome, Russell. Gene Bodenheimer, Genco Supply Chain Solutions, speaking with us today about analyzing and preventing damage in the supply chain. Thanks for watching.